the second time I was accused of witchcraft. <laughs> I was 25 years old and going to Africa my first time to conduct field research. My research that summer took me, a white woman from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, just starting her PhD program, to a small rural community in Eastern Africa, in Tanzania. Our goal that summer was investigating the origin of our species, documenting and excavating sites associated with those long lost ancestors. And while we were ultimately successful in doing this, and this is work we continue to this day, it was not the scientific truths that we uncovered, but rather the truths, the accusation of witchcraft revealed about myself and my work as an archeologist that resonates with me to this day. So, what happened was this. Myself, my PhD researcher, her other PhD student, a Tanzanian archeologist, and several government officials were working in a community. We were excavating a site that was directly adjacent to a village. And of course, we drew a lot of interest. It's not every day that people show up in your backyard and dig some holes, I imagine. <laughs> and so local people visited our site on a daily basis. And they expressed a very serious and often suspicious concern about the work that we were doing in their own backyard. And again, this not being an everyday occurrence, we can validate some of that suspicion right off the, the bat. But the reality is many communities across the globe are suspicious of the work that archaeologists do. We are scientists representing the scientific community, and that draws much suspicion. Of course, there's lots of tensions around resource extraction and use, and of course, misgiving about foreign interests in our communities, on our land, in our nations. So used to this suspicion and used to this interest, we continued to dig. And we dug because we had all of the right permissions in place, visas and permits, research clearance, we had funding, and so we continued our work in pursuit of scientific truths. But suspicion creates tension, and the tensions would continue to rise at the site, culminating on the 17th of August in 2006, when a fight would break out, a fight between my Tanzanian colleague and the individuals who had been observing us excavating at the site every day. Now this fight occurred in Swahili, and I still have only baby Swahili to this day, so I understood very little of what was going on, but I'd never heard a shouting match and words being exchanged in anger at an archeological site before. But this was one word I did understand. Mzungu, white person. Some other words I understood were this, chupa yamaji, or water bottle. White person, water bottle. Why are they arguing? Well, there was another word I heard, but I didn't understand until my Tanzanian colleague explained to me what it means. Machawi, or witch. Mazungu, chupa yamaji, machawi. So what's the connection? Well, every day at lunch, we would share whatever we had, water bottles, cookies, oranges, nuts, bananas, with whoever was at the site with us, and we would eat lunch together. And I was frustrated by the growing amount of plastic water bottles we were generating with no recycling program in place, so I decided to fill up my green Nalgene bottle at the hotel every day. Clever, right? And I didn't think anything of this. But the locals, the people observing us sure did. Because if my white skin wasn't enough, and the way I'd been exercising my privilege and power at the site by digging in light of this suspicion and distrust, well, here we had some proof. This green bottle contained not water, but poison. 
The truth is it's not about the water bottle though, is it? And it's not actually even about the act of digging itself. It was about power and privilege. And anthropologists, when studying witchcraft accusations around the globe, have clearly demonstrated that that's what is always at the crux of witchcraft accusations, power. People accuse individuals of performing witchcraft of being a witch when they feel powerless, when they feel unheard and unseen and disregarded. And imagine someone does this to you in your own backyard. And again, remember, we had all the permissions in place, right? Visas and permits and letters of introduction from institutions that the community we were working in felt powerless against. So, when you cannot directly challenge institutions, when you are challenging people and they are not listening, what else do you have at your disposal? Burn the witch. She's a witch. At the time, I'll be honest, I didn't realize how serious this accusation was. Right? I was upset, actually, and hurt. Hurt that they would accuse me of something. All I wanted to do was pursue scientific truths and fact, what I thought was fact. But this was because, as I've come to realize, I was blinded by my white academic economic privilege. I didn't realize how I was using it to make people invisible. So blinded by this privilege and power, we continued to dig. Eventually, we would resolve without further conflict with the community we were doing, and I didn't get any physical harm, or no really even emotional harm, which is part of the privilege I have as well. But reflecting on this, it's made me realize a truth about myself. I am a witch. <laughs> a witch, from an anthropological perspective, is someone who causes harm, whether intended or not. And I did that. I leveraged my power and privilege to make people invisible, to make them feel unheard. Therefore, yes, I am a witch. But I don't have to be a bad witch. I can be a good witch. See, by acknowledging the power I have and the privilege I have by virtue of who I am, a white academic, right, who has all the right credentials, can get all the right visas, has the finances at my disposal that allow me to engage in this type of research, right? I don't have to use that for bad. How can I use this for good? Well, and I admit this is still an ongoing process, I can elevate the voices of the communities I work in. I can do work that is based on their interests, on their need, on their requests. I can go to schools and provide material. I can help provide displays and presentations for museums in the communities I work in. And I can talk to people, and most importantly, I can listen. And instead of getting hurt when people say they distrust me or they're suspicious because I'm yet another researcher who's coming into their communities and doing what I want and then never returning with information again and taking knowledge and taking and taking and taking, I can listen. I can take the tools at my disposal, including my power and privilege, and share and give and listen. Or to use a poor analogy, instead of worrying about how full my water bottle is, I can use the resources I have at hand, the water I have in my bottle, to fill up the bottles of those who need water. Thank you. <laughs>